Say it again. I love you, Lord. Do you mean it? Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Say this verse with me. For God so loved the world that he loved... Oh, God. Oh, God. Say it again. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Isn't that the, one of the greatest verses in the Bible? Isn't it? And we all know it by heart. We see it on the football fields. We see it up in the stands. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. If we stop and think about the implications of this, that God loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son, his only son. It just boggles the mind that God loved me that much to send someone that he loved and yet there's so many people out there that reject him turn their back on him and say no thank you yet god loves them enough to continue to offer that free gift that free gift that free gift nicodemus the rabbi came to jesus one night and he said you know i know you're a great teacher no one could do the miracles that you've done and not be from god and we know the story. Jesus begins to tell him that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. But he, he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the Holy Begotten Son of God. Our world stands condemned. Your neighbors who do not know Jesus stand condemned. Your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your mother, your father, your cousins, those that do not believe in Jesus Christ stand condemned already. May I ask you a question? If their salvation depends on you telling them, will they hear? We're going to be talking about that this morning. We're going to be talking about salvation and bringing them to Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love and mercy. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us, that we may have everlasting life. You gave us your son. Father, what a wonderful gift of, of, of everlasting life if we just but believe. Thank you so much, Father. We love you. We give you all the glory and all the honor. We give you praise. And Father, we're so thankful to be in your house this morning. May you bless this time together. May you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, you bring him and let him fill us this morning. Let, us, let our ears be opened and our hearts be attentive to your word. And may your spirit speak to us in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We want to welcome you to Grassy Valley this morning. We're glad that you're here. Would you stand together with me and just kind of turn around and wave at everybody right now? Because we're not, we're not doing hugs and shaking hands just yet. Not until all this COVID stuff is gone. But we want you to feel welcome this morning. You are part of our family. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for being here this morning. This week the Lord had laid on my heart <clears throat> the songs to, to sing. And of course, he kind of threw that one, uh, just a little talk with him this morning. Actually, I just like the music, so I was like, we got to sing this one. Um, but um, he laid on my heart this week that, you know, we need to, about confession, um, and he just laid on my heart that, you know, um, I, he's like, you know, well, he didn't say this, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, but he was like, sing songs that are usually sung at an invitation, because our altar here is always open. And so I just wanted to remind you that, you know, anytime we sing songs and whatnot, if you, if the Lord is convicting you, by all means, just come down here. Nobody's going to look at you at the wrong way. Um, this Just As I Am is a little different. There's a little special um, 
part in there in the in the chorus it's not the chorus but the the little special part there it says i come broken to be mended i come wounded to be healed i come desperate to be rescued i come empty to I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. So stand with me as we sing this song.
lives with passion. Going wherever God wants us to go begins with passion. My dad used to tell me that people do what they want to do if they want to do it bad enough. I've known people have passion for Disney World and they'll make every effort in the world to be at Disney World three and four times a year even if they live in California or Washington State or Alaska. I've seen people do a lot of crazy things because of passion. They have a passion for something. There's a sense of accomplishment. There's no greater feeling than getting something done that you've wanted to do all your life. When God calls you to go somewhere, it may, it may be to Timbuktu, or it may be right around the corner to your neighbor. It may just be right across the aisle from where you work to the next cubicle. But are you willing to go? There's no greater feeling than accomplishment. When I first moved into our house almost 20 years ago, we we decided to build a shed. And I got some men in my church that knew more about building than I did, and we started building the foundation. We put up the walls. We put up the siding. And I did a lot of the work myself. When they weren't there, I was doing it. And when it came time for the roof, we had some professionals do the, do the actual roof framing and put the, the, the boards on top. And then I decided that I was going to roof it myself. I was going to put the shingles on it. So I did the normal thing. I looked it up on YouTube. And I became a professional roofer after watching a five-minute video. And if you were to go look at it today, you'd say, no, that's not professional. But I didn't do a half-bad job. I did okay. It hasn't leaked once. But there was a sense of accomplishment after I got done with that. I looked at it and I went, hey, I did that. It's not too bad. And when you accomplish something great for the Lord, it's pretty satisfying. There's nothing greater, in my opinion, than leading someone to Christ. I've been there, I've led someone to Christ, I've prayed for somebody, and man, what a great sense of accomplishment that you did what God told you to do, and that they turned their life over to Jesus one of the greatest disciples, one of the disciples, you really don't hear much about him in the Gospel of John. If you've got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. You don't hear much about him. He's only mentioned like three times in the Gospel of John. And every time he's mentioned, he's mentioned bringing someone to Jesus. His name is Andrew. You don't read much about him. In fact, he, Andrew brings his brother to Jesus in John chapter 1. Who is, who is his brother? Simon Peter. In John chapter 6, he brings a little boy with two fishes and five loaves of bread to Jesus. In John chapter 12, he brings some Greeks that are wanting to meet Jesus. He brings them to Jesus. You see, after Andrew met the Lord, it seemed that all he wanted to do was bring people to Jesus. You know, when I... I get passionate about some people you know you know that I'm passionate about certain things in my life when I wanted to do something I usually do it and when I was little I started riding motorcycles and I stopped riding when I was out of high school and and then just a couple years back I decided to get back into it my bro my son wanted to ride and we we said well that's something I could do with him that's something I could do with my wife and so we started riding motorcycles and we enjoy it it's something we uh, it, it brings a lot of satisfaction. Some people like to shoot guns. Some people like to go ride motorcycles. Some people like to fly. Some people like to go shopping. Right? Amen. I'm hearing ladies say amen. Some people just like to travel. And there's a lot of satisfaction, a lot of joy in that. And, and you say, well, well, I've got to do certain things to get to that point. Well, you know, sometimes you just got to do it. If I waited until I was wealthy enough to do certain things, I probably would never do it. If I was going to wait till all my kids were out of the house, you know what? They never leave. Amen. Oh, we got, we got more amens now. Sometimes you just got to do it. You know, you just got to move on forward. And when you get passionate about certain things like Andrew did, when Andrew met Jesus, he got passionate about Jesus, and he just started bringing people to meet him. 
There is a commitment. John chapter 1, verse 35, I want you to see this, and this is the first point I want to make. There's a commitment here that takes platter, takes place. It's a commitment that takes, as we just, we just said, I will follow, I will do, I will go where he leads me. John chapter 1, verse 35, again the next day John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked upon Jesus and he walked, as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. You see, I think there's a matter of just following Jesus that's so important. In Matthew chapter 4 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 and many more passages in Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, all these gospels, Jesus said, come and follow me. You see, leading people to Christ is just a matter of obedience. You say, what is obedience? The, it, obedience is doing whatever that person says. It's going where they tell you to go. When I was a kid, my dad would say, get in the car, we're going. And I would get in the car, and we went. It was a matter of obedience. I loved my dad. I was also uh, very aware that my dad was the dad. He was in charge. And when you make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you know that he's in charge, right? Right? And you go where he tells you to go, and you do what he tells you to do. And when you think about what Jesus was doing here, this was a very religious society. Unlike America, in Israel during this day and time, everybody worshipped God, except for the Romans. Every Jew you came across loved Yahweh. That's all they were taught. They were a very religious society. So it was nothing for them to worship God, but it was something major to follow someone else other than God. And when Jesus said that I am he, that's a big deal. Because according to the Jewish mind, there was only one God, and his name was Yahweh. And now that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, and Jesus says, come and follow me, that was a big deal. You see, Peter had to leave his boat and his nets. Andrew had to leave his boat and his nets, all their income. Their income for their house, for their family, for everything. They left it all behind just to follow Jesus. That's a big deal. That's commitment. That's obedience. John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments, Jesus said. John chapter 14, verse 21, he said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will dis dis disclose myself to him. What does he say in the Gospels when he calls his disciples to follow him? He says in Mark chapter 1, And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And what did they do? They immediately, they didn't sit around and have a committee discussion about it. They didn't go to the pastor or to the deacons or to the rabbis and say, you know what, what do you think? They didn't go back home and talk to their wives and say, you know, let me get your, your thoughts on this idea. No, they, what they did was they left their nets and their boats and they immediately followed Jesus. Amen? Don't you wish we all had that kind of obedience in our hearts? Had that kind of commitment? You say, well, you know, that, I don't really exactly know what to do when Jesus says, come and follow me and just share the gospel. What does that mean? I, I really need to be trained with the mark. Listen, I'm, I'm nothing against training. I love training. In fact, if I didn't enjoy training and didn't think that training was necessary, I wouldn't have gone to school. But I went to seminary. I went to college. I went to seminary. I went to get my doctorate. I went all that because I wanted the training. I wanted the necessary training so that I could train others. I wanted to become a pastor. I wanted to lead others. I wanted to be the best that I could be. So I have nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with being trained. But it doesn't take training to say that you love Jesus. It doesn't take seminary training to say, you know what Jesus has done for me? All it takes is knowing Jesus. Now, I will grant you, the disciples had three and a half years of training with Jesus. They walked with him, they talked with him, they listened to him. He taught them every day. But, and there's nothing wrong with that. I love training. I think training is necessary, but it doesn't take a lot of training to say you love Jesus and listen to what Jesus has done for me. 
programs don't instill obedience. Programs are good, and the Southern Baptists have had their share of them. They've had faith training. They've had grow training. They've had share Jesus without fear training. They've had CWT training. They've had evangelism explosion training. And all these, all these programs are great. They're all good. They sometimes will motivate people. Sometimes they'll give them the foundation they need to share the gospel. But that doesn't instill obedience. Obedience comes with passion. It comes with love. It comes with a heart that says, you know, I want to follow God. I want to be faithful to what he's called me to do. They love him. They obeyed him. And when you follow Jesus, he will lead you to the lost people so that you can in turn lead them to him. I believe that's the greatest heart of Jesus is to lead people to him. That's what he did. I did not come to seek those who are not lost. I came to seek those who are lost and need a savior. That's what Jesus was doing, right? I came to seek and to save those who are lost. That's what Jesus did, that's what Jesus wants, and that's what the church is all about. Communion. Look at number two, communion with Jesus. Look at verse 38. And Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. And they came, therefore, and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And what is the tenth hour? Tenth hour, according to the Jewish calendar, probably around four o'clock in the afternoon. In other words, they spent all evening and all that night talking and fellowshipping with Jesus. The next morning, after spending all that time with him, they were so full of Jesus that they had to go tell somebody. They had to go share it. Listen, the more time you spend with Jesus, the better, the better you know Jesus. The better you know Jesus, the more excited you'll be about Jesus. The more excited you are about Jesus, the more you want to tell others about Jesus. I'm telling you, church, it begins with passion. We've looked at all, the, we've looked at all the, the purposes of the church. We're still looking at them. We're going to be looking the next two months at the purposes. But I'm going to tell you, the foundation for all the purposes is just having a passion for Jesus. Because worship grows out of a passion for Jesus. Fellowship grows out of a passion for Jesus because you love His family and you love His people. Evangelism grows out of a passion for Jesus. Discipleship will grow out of a passion for Jesus. And ministry will grow out of a passion for Jesus. It's all foundational on passion for Jesus. If you can grow your passion for Him and love for Him in the Word of God and in prayer, all these things will fall right into place. But it begins with passion. And that's who we are. Grassy Valley Baptist Church is a family with a passion for a relationship with Jesus Christ and for others. Amen? That's who we are. We have a passion. Look down at verse 38. And Jesus turned and beheld them following. I love the fact that they were following him. Already they just, they heard him speak and they began to follow. And Jesus turns around and says, what do you guys seek? They just want to know him. They just want to be with him. They spend time with him. Listen, I'm going to say something that may, that may shock you. It may, you may walk out there going, well, that was very offensive, Brother Mark. You hurt my feelings. Well, if you go to this church very long, you're going to realize I step on toes, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to offend or hurt anybody, but we're going to preach the Word of God here. And sometimes things are a little shocking, so please forgive me. I don't mean it to be offensive, but I'm going to say it anyway, okay? If you're not excited about leading people to Jesus, if you're not excited about sharing your faith with someone who's lost, then maybe it's because you're not excited about Jesus. You're not excited about the Savior. I believe it's an impossibility 
to have a quality, quiet time day by day, spend time with Jesus day by day, blessing Jesus, praising Jesus, loving Jesus, listening to Jesus, learning more about Jesus, getting filled with Jesus, and not be about bringing people to Him. You said, Brother Mark, have you brought people to him? Listen, I've brought people to Jesus. I'm not always successful, but praise God, we're going to learn about that in a few minutes. It's not up to me. My job is just to share of Jesus. Amen? My job is to be passionate about him and to share with others that I love Jesus and I want them to know Jesus the way that I know Jesus. It's up to Jesus to save. We'll talk about that. But it's my job to be faithful to share Jesus. To go try and introduce people to Jesus. Look at what happens here. They have a confession. Look at verse 40. One of the two had, who had heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. Now, after they had spent time with Jesus, guess, guess what they're doing? They're so full of him. They're, they're so full that they had to go and tell someone about him. And I've heard stories of many people who are witnessing experiences. And, and one that really sticks in my mind is, is one story about a woman who was approached in the lobby of a hotel by a man who asked her, Do you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior? Later on that evening, she goes up to her room. She tells her husband about it. She says, I had a man ask me, do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? And, the, and, the, and her husband goes, well, why didn't you just tell him to mind his own business? And she said, if you had seen his face, you would have thought that was his business. How often do we have a passion about us that it shows on our face, it shows in our actions, it shows in our, in our, our demeanor that when people are around us, they go, you're full of Jesus. That's my desire. I want to be able to walk around people. I want to be able to, to walk into a room and just and, and them know that there's something different about him. I want to be so full of Jesus that they are just they notice it. And then I want to tell them about it. They were seeking. Listen, church, ours is not a come and see religion. Ours is a go and tell salvation. Amen? I'll be honest with you, church. And here I'm, I'm going to start meddling, okay? But I'll be honest with you. I think a lot of churches have made the mistake of turning things backwards. They've made it so that we can be entertainers and, and, showboat and showmen and show women, And we want to have the best program, the best of everything so that people will come. That's not the way Jesus designed the church. We want people to be here. We do. We want to have the best we can do. We want to have great teachers. We want to have great music. We want to do it all for the glory of God, not to draw people in, but for the glory of God. We have the audience of one. Amen? Amen. That's why we do what we do, and we're going to do it the best we possibly can. But ours is not to attract the lost, because I'm here to tell you something. The lost don't want to seek God. The lost would rather be out there fishing. The loss would rather be out there playing golf. The, the loss would rather be out there shopping. The loss would rather be out there on the lake or at the mountains or doing something other than church. That's where the loss want to be, and that's where they'll be. Our job is to go to them. That's what he told us. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Then bring them in so they can be discipled so that they can be shared with the faith, so they can know Jesus Christ as their Lord, and they can be discipled and grow in Christ, so that they in turn will go out and share the gospel with others around them. Amen? Now we do. We want to have the best that we possibly can. We want to have it all. All for the glory of God, but not for the glory of Grassy Valley. You see, it's not about Grassy Valley. It's about the kingdom of God. We are, is a, we are a go and tell salvation. God is a seeker. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. Let me remind you that we're not saved looking for God. You were not saved looking for God. God was seeking you. And He found you. And you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. No man comes unto the Father except first the Father draws him. I don't ever hear parents, and, I'm, and it's sad when we see in this world parents who lose their children through a, whether it be 
uh, kidnapping or they're out on a in a big place like Disney or they're out in a big place and somebody somebody comes along and snatches their child I've never heard one parent never in all the years that I've been watching parents that love their children I've never heard one parent go well you know what we have a color TV and he has a game system he knows where he lives he'll find his way back never once I've always heard the parents plea and cry and beg for people to help them find their lost child amen and I'm going to tell you something, church. You have someone next door to you, and you have somebody in your family, and you have somebody at your workplace, and you have somebody that cuts your hair, and you have somebody that will wait on you this afternoon at the, at the, at the restaurant, and you know people that are in your... You know people all around you that are lost today, and they don't know the way home. They're going down that broad street to destruction. And here you are on the side of the road pointing to the narrow way. That's the way it ought to be. And we ought to be on the sidelines screaming, this is the way to eternal life. That way is destruction. You're going the wrong way. This is the way. This is narrow. This is hard to find. But I have found it. I'll show you. This is the way to eternal life. And yes, some will keep walking. In fact, the majority will keep walking. The Bible says that many will go to destruction. But few few will find the narrow way hopefully you will be one of those on the sidelines screaming this is the way did you notice who they sought andrew sought his family philip sought his friend they started in their own backyard one started at home the other started with his neighbor both started with people that they knew and loved I was speaking with a man this last week, a man that I work with on the bus lot. I only see him ever so often because I only drive in the mornings. And I've known this man for quite, a, quite some time. He's a, a professing Christian, goes to church. As we were talking, I was talking to him about his family, and he was bragging on his kids, and of course I was bragging on mine. And He was bragging about his daughter and, and how she's been doing well and financially and how god has blessed her and his son and both talking about financial gain and how good god has been to them and how successful they have been and then i i asked the question i said well does your daughter go to church does she love the lord oh yeah she goes to church i said how about your son i understand he's a good musician does he go to church anywhere and he said well no he doesn't believe in god and i said well have you talked to him about this how do you feel about that he goes well how do i feel about it he said well i, I don't want to force it down his throat i don't want to preach too hard at him i don't want to make him i don't want to push him away so i don't i just don't say anything he said i'm just hoping that when we when when time is over and we're standing before god that god will have mercy on him by that time church it's too late my heart sank when he said that to me and i didn't know what to say i'll be honest with you i didn't know what to say i just kind of i said well I'll, I'll be praying that's all i knew was i'll be praying for him i turned around and went back and was sitting around and, and finally i just, god just spoke to me he said you need to go back and talk to him so i did i went back and i said chet i said something's bothering me i said um your son is not a professing christian you know the lord i said if you know the lord and you love the lord and you are professing that you do don't you have a passion for the lord and he said well he said yeah i, I love the lord he said i've kind of backed out i used to be a deacon i used to serve he says, he says but i really want to just kind of back out and just kind of enjoy church which gave me another clue when, when Christians start backing out of what God has given them, the talents and the abilities that God has given them, and they don't use them anymore, there's something not right about that. You know? And when God gives you an ability, God gives you talent, then you ought to be using that for the Lord. And when you stop being a deacon, or you stop teaching, or you, start ser you stop serving because you want to enjoy church, there's no enjoyment when you're not serving the Lord. And I told him that. I said, look, Chad, you've got... Listen, there's more. I'll never find more joy than when I'm serving. 
Yeah, sometimes I get burned out, sometimes I get tired, but there's no more joy than when you're serving. I said, your son needs to see in you a passion for Jesus Christ. Because if he doesn't, then he's not going to believe. And number, that's number one, you've got to live it. Number two, you've got to say it. I said, Chet, you've got to tell him. I said, if your son was going to run out in the middle of the street with a knife and play, would you warn him that there's cars coming and that knives are dangerous? Would you tell him? Yeah. I said, then, then his eternal destiny is at stake. If you're not going to tell him that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, then you have to ask yourself, do you really love him? Well, I really love my son. Are you kidding me? Yes. But the problem is people don't look at eternal damnation as being real. If we really knew what eternal damnation was, we'd be about the Father's business because we would understand this is eternal to eternity at stake. This isn't just a, a burn on the stove. This is forever in torment. And if you love someone enough to keep them from playing in the street, then you love them enough to tell them the truth about eternal life. Amen? Listen to what they did. Listen, Andrew and, 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 his, and Philip, they, they went out speaking. They, just, they didn't just go and say, you know what, we're going to live a godly life. We're going to follow Jesus and not say a word. Listen, I love lifestyle evangelism. Don't get me wrong. I think we have to live it or we don't believe it. Amen? We have, to we have to live it or we don't believe it. So people need to see a difference in us. They need to see the passion of Jesus Christ in us. But that's not enough. Because we're just sitting around living a God in life, hoping that they're going to ask us the right questions. Listen, that's not enough. We have to say we love you enough to tell you about Jesus Christ. I was part of a church that did mission trips all the time and they would go up to Appalachian and they would go up north up to West Virginia and they would bring clothes and they would bring food and they would do all this other stuff for them and I'd say well that's awesome did y'all share Jesus Christ well no 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 we just want to show them the love of Jesus <laughs> then you're no better than the Red Cross you're no better than Goodwill you're no better than, than, than just kind of dumping things off on people. Let's give them clothes and give them food, but let's give them the most important thing. That's Jesus Christ. Share the gospel. Share the gospel. That's what you're all about. And here's another point. Conversion. Conversion by Jesus. Listen, conversion is not up to us. Thank goodness. Because I'm not always eloquent when it comes to talking with people. Sometimes I don't know the right things to say. Like the other day, I, I had to turn and walk away. I didn't know, and God said, you need to go back. And then God began to give me the words to say. And even then, I don't know if I was eloquent enough. Even then, I have to depend on the Holy Spirit to do the work. Listen, that's what it's all about anyway. We just have to be faithful to share. God, the Holy Spirit, will do the work. He's the one who saves. Five people got saved that day. One right after the other and notice how the conversions were accomplished there was a personal presentation before the people were saved there was a personal presentation of the lord jesus christ john the baptist said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world jesus said follow me andrew and peter both said we have found jesus come and see everybody was involved Jesus was not winning everybody jesus won philip but he did not bring nathaniel or peter if this city, if this community, if this county, if this country, if this continent is going to be presented with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will not be done by a few superstar preachers and a staff. It will be done by the Andrews and the Phillips and the Nathaniels and the Peters. Amen? That's how it's going to be done. It's going to be done by you and me on a one on one personal invitation. Oh, we would all love to have the Pentecost. I would love to be able to preach and see 3,000 come to know the Lord. But the most effective evangelism takes place when I go and I talk to one person one-on-one -on -one and I begin a relationship and I begin to share with them Jesus Christ and tell them how I love them and how God loves them and see them come to know the Lord. Can I ask you a question? If the salvation of your city depended on your desire to witness, would this city come to Christ?
if the salvation of your family depended on your desire to witness for Jesus Christ, would your family come to know him? There is a personal presentation. There's also a positive declaration. Both Andrew and Philip declared, we have found Jesus Christ. We have found the Messiah. You know what this tells me? He has to be real in your life before you can share it with somebody else. Again, passion. Again, it has to be real in you. Thirdly, there's a persuasive confrontation. Over and over, everyone who was saved in this passage of Scripture was confronted one-on-one with the person of Jesus Christ. To confront simply means to bring face to face. Listen back in verse 42, it says, He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. There is a transformation that takes place. That's the next one. A powerful transformation when Peter and Nathaniel were confronted with Jesus there was a tremendous transformation in their life Jesus Peter Jesus gave Peter a new name why because Simon was a new creature look down at verse 42 he brought him to Jesus Jesus looked at him and said you are Simon the son of John you shall be called Cephas which is translated Peter he gave Nathaniel a new nature did you know that Look down at verse 46. And Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Philip said, Come and see. I want you to meet him. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, the Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You see, when he met Jesus, he went from being a foe to a friend, from a doubter to a disciple, from a blindness to sight, from darkness to light, from from weakness to might, from wrong to right. There is a transformation that took place. Listen, when I met Jesus Christ, I was only five years old. There's not a lot to correct at that age. You know? I wished I had, you know, as I grew up, I wanted, I wanted to have that great testimony. You know, you'd go and hear preachers preach, and I was saved when I was just a drunkard. I was, I was saved out of drugs and drunkard. And then when I turned 14, I came to know Jesus Christ. He changed my life. I stopped, stopped stealing, and I stopped robbing banks, and I stopped running around with women, you know. I thought, wow, what a transformation. My dad looked at me one time. He said, son, God gave you the bigger blessing. He kept you from it. He changed your heart and kept you from that lifestyle because sinners live that lifestyle. Sinners do what sinners do. We shouldn't be shocked. And the only thing that's going to stop the riots, the only thing that's going to stop the, 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 the liberals, the only thing that's going to stop the waywardness, the only thing that's going to stop the sin and the debauchery and the, the wickedness of this world is Jesus Christ. And we've got to start sharing him with other people. It's not going to take mass crusades. It's going to take one-on-one evangelism. One-on-one. Sharing with people the love of Jesus Christ. It transforms you. It changes you. It turns you inside out the things you once loved you can't stand anymore the things that you once desired you can't stand anymore you're looking for love you're looking for for all the peace you're looking for joy and and you can't find it you can't find it in money you can't find it in power you can't find it in love you can't find it in popularity you can't find it anywhere else except in jesus christ he's the only way it changes you it transforms you The transformation that only Jesus can bring is the only hope for this world. This gospel message is our duty to share, for we are to go into all the world and make disciples. So let me ask you this morning, do you have a passion for Jesus? 
Do you have a commitment to Jesus? Do you, are, is your heart fully in love with him? It's easy to get sidetracked. It's easy to follow after the world because it's all, we're always bombarded by it. You, you can walk out today and go see billboards down the street that'll try to take your mind off of Jesus and put it on things. You can go home and watch TV, and it'll always have something on there to say, you're not satisfied, that's why you need this new car. You're not satisfied, that's why you need this new job. You're not satisfied, that's why you need to invest your money in this. You're not satisfied, that's why you need to go to this place. They're always trying to tell you, you're not satisfied, and they're right. Unless you have Jesus. Jesus can satisfy and the world is looking for all the right answers in all the wrong places. And we have the right answer. This is the purpose of the church. It is to worship. It is to fellowship. It's also to evangelize the lost. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the truth of God's word. We thank you for the truth that we find in the life of Nathaniel and Philip and the men that followed you. Father, they were so excited after meeting the Messiah. They had to go share it. Father, will you create that excitement in our life once again? Will you create that passion in each heart this morning? Father, will you change us and take away our, all these distractions? Father, will you focus our lives upon you that we may have that passion for you? And everything else, everything else we're teaching and preaching will just fall into place if we just have a passion, a heart for you. Father, create in all of us a passion. A passion to know you, to love you, to spend time with you to share you. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We stand together. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, the altar is open. May you come to Him this morning. Mm -hmm.